first song is going to be Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. The first song, please change the song, is going to be How Great Thou Art. We'll be singing some words in English and some in Spanish. Yeah. 
let us stand as we pray. Our loving Father, to you we come today, at the end of the week. It's a little cool outside, Lord, but I pray that the fire from your throne will warm our hearts inside. Bless us as we listen to the message that you have from your throne. Thank you for everyone that is here. And I pray, Lord, that we will set everything aside, open our hearts, be led by your spirit, and we will be blessed. Because in your presence, there is always fullness of joy. We are always blessed when we come in your presence. So thank you. In the loving name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. May we see that. Welcome everyone. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, today I have a gift for somebody. Uh, I'm going to give a gift to Giselle. She's sitting right there. Right. And uh, I have some magazines, Hidden Truths, and they're in Spanish. All right, Spanish. So I'm going to give the Spanish speakers uh, the Hidden Truths. Can you Those, this? Raise your hands. And give Lupita one as well. And just remember that those who come five consecutive nights will get a study Bible, uh, whether it's the Amazing Facts Study Bible or the Andrews Study Bible. The Amazing Facts Study Bible is in, well, it's in English, and the Andrews Study Bible is in Spanish, all right? And uh, those who come for 10 consecutive nights will get the Strong's Concordance. If you're a Bible student or you want to become a Bible student, this is a very great tool to have. And of course, if you're here for all the 15 or so nights or evenings, then you will get a full medical physical. How about that? <laughs> or, or a dinner for two at Food Amen. All right? Vegetarian, a vegan restaurant. All right, so those of you who have been coming every night, don't stop. Those who have come for one or two nights, keep on coming. You can be blessed. And this time we're going to have our health nugget. <coughs> Thank you. Let me go ahead and say good evening to everyone. Good evening. All right. Um, there is something very special that I want to share with you this evening. And this one is going to deal with something that's very appropriate for Friday evening. Uh, Friday evening, for many, especially for those of us, many of us here, is a special time. It is not merely a Friday evening, but it is the beginning of what the Bible calls the Sabbath day of rest. And it's a time of rest. It's a time of refreshing. And so it is that I want to talk this Friday evening about rest, and I want to talk about the importance of it. There are many diseases that unfortunately people are suffering with that are largely connected to lack of rest. There is a book that I have the privilege of uh, owning, of course you can own it too, all you got to do is look it up. It's one of the latest books written on the subject of rest, and all the book studies about is all of the scientific data connected to why is sleep so important. In fact, that's what the title of the book is. It's called Why We Sleep. That's the name of the book, Why We Sleep. If any of you love to read and love to study about some of the scientific principles connected to this wonderful habit of good rest, you definitely want to add this to your library. Why We Sleep. I believe the author's name is Matthew, Dr. Matthew Sullivan. 
And one of the things that he has found through scientific data, which is pretty powerful, is that if an individual does not get enough sufficient sleep on a regular basis, that this can become the precursor to some of the neurological disorders that we read about today. Things like multiple sclerosis, things like Alzheimer's, things like dementia, even things like Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, and the list goes on. If you want to avoid a lot of these neurological diseases, one of the very best things you can do is ensure that you give your body some good, proper rest. You ever heard of this thing called brainwash? You know, you, you, nobody wants to be brainwashed, right? Well, did you know that there's a brainwash that your body does every night? When you and I go throughout a day whether it's because we're in a room filled with paint and carpets that release toxins in the air, certainly if you're outside and you got car after car passing you, and again, a lot of emissions and things are in the air, uh, certainly if you work in certain fields like auto mechanics where you're surrounded by diesel fluid and these type of things, things that you breathe in, we get toxicity from just about any and everything nowadays. Well, our body, goes through a large amount of repair when you sleep. Our bodies go through a large amount of repair. And there are toxins that can build up in the body that one of the things that your brain does every night, there's chemicals, hormones released, that actually does what we would call a natural brainwash. One of the things that's connected with dementia, Alzheimer's, and many of the other type of diseases dealing with the neuro neurological system is something called amyloid plaque, amyloid plaque buildup. And our bodies, made by God, fearfully and wonderfully made, our bodies, when we get proper rest, is as it were, it goes through a natural brainwash. And chemicals are released that helps wash away all of those vicious toxins and all of these things that build up in our system. And so proper rest becomes something absolutely imperative. There are going to be three things. Now, again, next week, remember, we, we're family. I'm here for two more weeks. Can you stand me for two more weeks? Yes. I hope you don't mind. I'm, I'm going to be all in your face and all there. I'm telling you, but I'm going to enjoy every bit of it. And I'm here to tell you some wonderful things. Do you know that there are three things that can help you get ready to have some good rest? And one of the things I like doing is giving instruction on things that you can do immediately. You know, I don't like to do things where you got to plan a whole month before you can get it done. So I like doing things where you can do it immediately. Do you know there are three things that you can do that can help give your body some good rest? And you can, again, start tonight. And already, nature is on our side. Watch this. Three things that you can do that can help you get good rest. Number one... Your room should be cool. That's why I told you nature's on our side. Because I don't know if you noticed that tonight feels very different than all the other nights. So this is a great night to open those windows. But you want to make sure that you keep your room cool. Your body temperature naturally drops whenever you go to sleep. But also, the body works best. As long as there's not any ailments that we're dealing with, you know, if you're anemic or anything like that, then obviously my counsel that I'm giving you would not be the best to do. But if you have a system that pretty much is working as normal, if you can get your room temperature down to about 69 to 68 degrees, and that's all right, just get under your cover. That's the reason if you're married, to just snuggle up a little bit more with your spouse. But you want to get that room temperature down to about 69 to 68 degrees. We're going to call that simply a cool room. So rule number one is when you want to go to bed, try to make sure that your room is cool. And when we say cool, again, about 69, 68 degrees. That's number one. Number two, your room needs to be dark. And I'm talking about dark to the point that you don't want a cell phone and lights from the charger. It's amazing how a little blue light from a charger can really light up a room when you cut all the rest of the lights off. And what we're talking about is a room that's completely dark. Charge, charge your phone outside your room. Charge it someplace else. If you have a clock, put something over that bright digital light that's shining. You want your room dark. Dark, dark, dark. Black. Why? You have two hormones that really work very well together. 
serotonin and melatonin. And when you get up in the morning and when you expose your eyes to light, that is when your serotonin... Does anybody know the nickname for serotonin? Anybody know the nickname for your serotonin? It's called your happy hormone. Okay, your happy hormone. Seriously, it's called your happy hormone. I just discovered that there might be some meetings that take place next week. That should we have those meetings, if we confirm that, you are going to get exposed to some beautiful truths. And you're going to want to tell all your friends about it and your family. One of the things we'll talk about is a lot more on this serotonin. But the point is very simple. The more you expose your eyes to daylight, it causes a beautiful hormone released from the hypothalamus and the pineal gland in the brain. And it helps release this wonderful thing called serotonin. It's not only your happy hormone, but it also keeps you alert throughout the day. But then, when the sun begins to set and it's starting to get closer to bedtime, you want your serotonin levels to go down, that your melatonin levels will rise. The best way, in fact, the only way, to get your melatonin to rise is you need to be in a room that's dark. Your melatonin is what works well for you in getting good sleep, okay? So that's what you want to do is, number one, the room needs to be cool. We're talking about 69, maybe 68 degrees. Number two, you want your room to be dark. Number three, third rule, very simple, give it a shot tonight. Number three, you need your room to be quiet. Your room needs to be completely quiet. You want to make sure there's no television playing. You want to make sure there's no music playing. When it's time to sleep, your brain needs to relax. And sometimes when you play music and when you're playing programs and you're playing a lot of things, it's amazing how your mind can get so used to it that your mind develops a state of activity when it should be resting. So when you go to sleep, you want to make sure that the room is cool, you want to make sure your room is dark, and you want to make sure that your room is quiet. And one of the best things that you can do, this is a little bonus tip here, again, we'll talk a whole lot more about it when we get together sometime next week. But one of the other things that you really want to do is prepare yourself a bit. Wind down. Well, what do I mean by that? If you know you go to bed at 10 o'clock, maybe around 8 o'clock, start dimming the lights. Start dimming the lights. Don't, don't turn it off and then you're going to start tripping all over the place. But definitely turn down. Start dimming the lights a little bit. Start finishing whatever you have to finish with your electronics, cell phones and tablets and all that other stuff. Start finishing up what you need to finish so that about a good hour to an hour and a half before bedtime, no more of that radiant light coming from those phones. And you will find that it starts preparing your mind for some good rest. And that way you can enjoy a good night's sleep. That's our health nugget for tonight. Three rules. When you go to bed, make sure your room is cool. cool. When we talk about cool, what kind of degrees are we aiming for? 68. 69 to 68. The next thing your room needs to be is dark. Dark. dark, no light. Finally, the last room, your room also needs to be quiet. quiet. And you will find that if you put these simple little things into practice, it ultimately creates an atmosphere where you can get some pretty awesome rest. I hope you get some good sleep tonight. Not now, <laughs> but tonight. All right? All right. God bless you. That's our help like it for you. stand for our theme song, Troublesome Times Are Here.
Let me go ahead and say good evening to everyone. Good evening. All right. I'm very grateful for an opportunity for us to once again come together that we can study the Word of God and that we can arrive at understanding God's truth in such a way that its designed impact will take place in yours and my life. And that is that we will know the truth so well that it will make us free. And so as we prepare our hearts to go through our study this evening, our topic is a very beautiful topic. It's a question that needs to be answered. And that question is, how do I get clean? And how do I stay clean? And so by God's grace, we're going to cover this subject and make it plain. And so as we prepare our hearts to receive this word, I believe the best way to do that is upon our knees. And so if you can, I'd like to invite you to kneel with me for a word of prayer. And if you cannot kneel, it's all right. You just go ahead and bow your heads reverently where you are. But if you can kneel, let us kneel together. Our loving Father, we are eternally grateful. We thank you so much that you have allowed us to make it up until this time in the week in which we now can enter into an experience and a period of very beautiful spiritual rest. And Lord, we just simply avail ourselves to you. Our heads are bowed and we're upon our knees and we recognize your greatness and we come to you and ask for the forgiveness of our sins. We pray for your Holy Spirit. And we ask you that you might touch our hearts through what we study together this evening. For we ask all of these things in the worthy and mighty name of Jesus. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. All right. So, 
Yes. The computer, the clicker. I'm connected to the, uh, yeah, it shows that I'm connected to the airplay. While we're waiting to go ahead and handle these technical difficulties, we're going to review uh, what we discussed last night. Last night was a very important topic because last night we had to face reality. We had to deal with the fact that there are some things that we need to be willing to acknowledge about our true condition. And as we acknowledge what our true condition is, it prepares us to know what we need to receive. And so last night we were looking at, you know, our true condition and, and we saw ourselves in the light of what the Word of God says. And that was very helpful for us because we were able to be what the Bible calls sober. We were able to kind of sober up a bit and understand that, you know, in the eyes of God is the only image that really counts. It is imperative that we see ourselves the way God sees us. Because any way we try to measure ourselves otherwise, we're going to show ourselves to be unwise. And the Bible teaches that. When we measure ourselves among ourselves, the Bible says we are not wise when we do that. I can always find a reason to say I'm better than you. You can always find a reason to say you're better than me. Watch this. I can always find a reason to say I'm worse than you. You can always find a reason to say you're worse than me. And every single one of those points can be completely wrong. And so what God gave us last night was a sobering truth to help us understand our true condition. And the true condition is that whether you're the President of the United States or whether you're per one of the people that simply does a humble duty in life, we are all on the same playing ground when it comes to our true condition. We are sinners in need of the grace of God. Amen. And so last night we were able to do away with all of our false forms of righteousness. We were able to do away with all these things that we typically give ourselves credit for and put ourselves above and beyond other people. And we were able to just simply let the Word of God show us our true condition, which is that we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked sinners. But that's the very people we saw last night that Christ came to save. Those are the very same people that God has come to and said, I want to save you. But here's the deal. I want you to think about this. How many of you tonight would like a, how many of you would like $1.5 million? How many of you would like that? Would you like that? All right. Now watch this. Here's the point of my question. Let's say somebody came to you and wrote a check for $1.5 million. If somebody wrote you a check, and they were known to be very wealthy, right? If somebody wrote you a check for $1.5 million, how many of you honestly would be happy about that? They wrote you a check for $1.5 million. How many of you would be happy? All right. Do you know that I have to tell you, if somebody came to me and wrote me a check for $1.5 million, I would not be happy. I'd be curious. Now, the reason I say that is very simple. I'm just as broke with a $1.5 million check in my hand as I was without it in my hand. I'm just as broke. In other words, the only time that that $1.5 million check becomes valuable is when I take it from my hand, go to my bank, and cash the check. Are you following? When Jesus died on the cross, it was a check written. It was, as it were, a check written with endless amounts of zeros behind it. It surpasses millions and billions and zillions. It was a truly check without limit. But you have to cash it to enjoy the benefits. Are you following that? 
And so last night we learned that Christ came, and yes, he did die for the sinners of the world, of which you and I see ourselves as a category, but the reality is, is you don't get the benefit until you cash the check. Tonight, I want to talk about how to cash the check. You understand that? That's a different discussion than what we had last night for those of us who were here. There's many faces here tonight that was not with us last night. But I'm letting you know right now that it's great to tell the story about Jesus dying for humanity. Jesus came to save sinners. That's a beautiful story. But I need that story to become personal. I need that story to become personal. I got a favorite book that I love to read. Um, you know, I'm sure we all have books we love to read. And one book that I just, I can't get enough of it next to my Bible is a book called Ministry of Healing. It's a book that I absolutely love to read. And I've gone through that book cover to cover many times. And it seems like every time I pick it up, it's like reading a brand new book all over again. And I remember I was just perusing over page 514, and, and it talked about how a person can study the Bible verse by verse. They can listen to sermon after sermon. It talks about how they can attend church week after week. But it says, but until they take the teachings from the sermons, from the books, and from everything else, until they take the teachings and bring it into their personal, daily life, it will give them no benefit. That's what I mean when I talk about cash the check. I don't want you to just know the story of salvation. You need to know the story of salvation for you. You got to understand that the world today says, that's a great story, but what's that got to do with me? And people are asking that question all the time. Because the truth of the matter is, is that imagine, you know, you come to a church and, you know, right now the churches are telling people to come to the church because here's the bottom line. When a person is invited to church, the people who are part of the church believe that they have something better than what that person presently has. You okay with that? That's, that's truthful. The reason people say come to the church or come, you know, give your heart to Christ is because you're trying to communicate to the person whatever you have and whatever good you think it may be, when you come to this and when you accept this, you're going to find something even better. So can you imagine when somebody comes and they, they say, okay, you know, so what do you have to tell me? Well, I want to tell you about God's righteousness, okay? What else do you want to tell me? Well, I want to tell you about God's program for health. Okay, so what else do you want to tell me? I want to show you how God can show you how to have a happy marriage, okay? What else do you want to tell me? I want to show you how God can show us how to have happy families. And do you know what that person, if they're smart, and today we live in a very intelligent generation, you know what that person sooner or later is going to say? Okay. One question. How's it working for you? <laughs> you think that's a fair question? Honestly, isn't that a fair question? If you are telling me you have something better than what I have, which is the communication of the church, the church is communicating to the unchurched, we have something better than what you have, and you need to come and get some of what we got then those people have every right to say, what kind of impact is it having in your home? How's it working for your marriage? How are you doing physically? They have a right to ask those questions, don't you agree? And so this is what I'm saying, is that it's not enough to tell the story of salvation. It's not enough to paint this beautiful picture of a check that was written. Somebody wants to know, what did it feel like when you cashed it? What did it do for you? I have learned something a long time ago in these 27 years that I've been acquainted with this thing called the everlasting gospel. If there's one thing that I've gotten very clearly in my mind, a gospel that is not practical is truly a worthless gospel. It's worthless. It means nothing. Because if I want to hear a good story, I can go to the nearest movie theater. If I want to hear a good story, I can just put on a play. When I come to church, I don't want to hear a story. I want you to tell me about something that's real, something that works. You understand that? And that's what a whole lot of hungry people are looking for. And so there's a lot of us that come to church talking about cleansing, but we're not clean yet. And God wants to get us clean, 
And then after he cleans us up like anything else. You ever seen your room when it was really clean? Don't you like it? Yeah. You ever seen your car when it's really clean? Yeah. Don't you like that? Yeah. You ever gone to your desk at work and you have a desk and you can literally look at your desk and almost take a picture of it and make it the model of what a desk should look like at every office? I mean, when you have a clean room, desk, car, or anything else, you know the next mission, right, is to keep it clean. Isn't that right? And that's why our subject tonight is so vital. We're talking about not only how to get clean, but then how to stay clean, because last night we discovered we are filthy. The Bible spells out how to get clean so easily that I'm going to show you three verses that just breaks it down. I mean, these three verses right here is going to show you clear as day how to get clean. So if any of you came in here and you feel dirty, you feel terrible, you made some bad decisions in your life and then beat yourself up, maybe for days, weeks, months, years, or even decades, I want to show you how once and for all by the grace of God, because now we've learned what faith is. Faith is trusting the Word of God only. I want to show you what the Word of God says of how you can get clean. Three verses. Take a look. The first verse comes from 1 John 1 and verse 9. And I want you to watch the words very carefully. And my challenge to you is don't take it as a vain repetition. That's what heathens do. I want you to take it as the authoritative, loving Word of God from His lips to your heart. The Bible says, if we what? If we confess our sins, the Bible says, He, that's God, is faithful and just to do two things. What are the two things that He does? He forgives us our sins, but then He also does something else. And to cleanse us from how much? If He cleanses you from all unrighteousness, then how much unrighteousness do you have remaining? None. So do you know what that means? The Bible literally says that God is so powerful that He can cleanse you from all unrighteousness, which means that the only thing left is righteousness. Now watch this. According to this verse, what is it that we need to do to get clean? Confess your sins. Isn't that right? Confess your sins. Take ownership. But do you know... This is not the only verse you should focus on. In other words, the Bible was given to mankind as a whole. One of the biggest reasons why we have so much religious confusion in the world is because people like to take one verse and build a religion off of it. You understand that? That's one of the reasons why we have such vicious religious confusion in the world. It's because people will take just a verse and then build a whole belief system off of it rather than taking the whole of Scripture. Paul says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means that we've got to look at the whole Bible. So it doesn't stop here because I want you to see the next step of getting clean. The next verse we're going to consider is Isaiah 55 and verse 7. In Isaiah 55 and verse 7, let's take a look at the instruction here. It says, let the wicked do what? Forsake his way. And the unrighteous man, his what? His thoughts. And let him do what? Return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So I want you to notice that. This is speaking about the same effect that we just read in 1 John 1, 9. But do you see something in this verse you did not see in 1 John 1, 9? Do you see anything in verse 7 of Isaiah 55 that's different than what you saw in 1 John 1, 9? What do you see that's different in this verse? It makes it very clear that there has to be a forsaking of wrong ways. Isn't that different than just confessing your wrong you understand that? Yeah. They're both coming to the same end. The same end is that you get pardoned. You get forgiven and you get cleansed. That's the same end result. But here we're seeing an additional instruction that sometimes we don't pay attention to that if all we did was quote 1 John 1, 9. 
So the Bible is very clear. We definitely have to confess our sins. No question about that. But then in addition to that, it says we must forsake our way. But what else do you have to forsake? You got to forsake the way you think. You ever thought about that? God says you got to be willing to change the way you think. You ever met a hard-headed person? You ever met somebody who was stubborn? Do you know what the Bible calls stubbornness? Because that's a hard-headed person, right? This, the, in other words, there's a lot of people that are not willing to forsake the way they think. Look, this is the way I am, it is what it is. Either like it or love it. <laughs> I mean, seriously, that's how a lot of people function. It, it, hey, I am who I am. Either you deal with it or you can leave. And this is the attitude that a lot of people have. Those are people that are going to be thoroughly disappointed on that day of judgment. But what we must understand is that God says it's not enough that you're willing to turn from a bad way. God says you must also be willing to turn away from bad thinking. That's deep. And the thing that typically keeps us from, you know, making decisions to change the way we think is that thing called stubbornness. Now, let me ask you a question. Let's say you, you know, let's say you walked in a store and you saw a, a, like a, a statue of a fish or a statue of an elephant, you know, a statue of some kind of animal. And let's say you walked in a certain store and, and you walked in there just to look around and you saw somebody right there at the foot of that thing and they, and, and let's say they didn't worship him, right? They just worship him in, <laughs> kissing his feet, you know, doing all that. They just bow down before this elephant or whatever it may be. You know, would there be anything that goes on in any of your minds that would say, what is this person doing? You know, why are they bowing down to some statue of an elephant or some other animal? What's wrong with them? Wouldn't some thoughts like that probably go along in your head? Yeah? Because, you know, that's called idolatry in the Bible. And idolatry, you know, the worship of other images and all these other things. But, but let me show you something. Go to, go to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 15. And I, I want to show you something that Man, maybe we've never considered this before. In 1 Samuel, we're looking at the 15th chapter, and I, and I wanted you to see what the Bible said. That book that we promised to trust its words only. And so it is that in 1 Samuel, the 15th chapter, I just want you to see what the Bible says, because it's quite amazing. In 1 Samuel 15, verses 22 and 23, I want you to see what the Bible says, and I want you to remember that little exercise that I did just there, one bowing down to the image. It says in 1 Samuel 15 and verse 22, and Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in what? Obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than what? It's better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Now, verse 23 is deep. It says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And then it says, and what else? Stubbornness, Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Do you know that when we entertain and even boast about how stubborn we are, we are no different than the one who is bowing down and kissing the feet of that image and practicing idolatry. Because we're worshiping the God of our own image, which is me. My brothers and sisters, God says, you want to get clean? God says it's not enough just to confess your sin. God says you must be willing to turn away from the wrong ways of life. And God says, and the best way to turn away from the wrong ways of life is to be willing to turn away from wrong ways of thinking. Because it's the way we think that brings us to making the bad choices. So true cleanliness, that cleansing that God truly wants to give to each and every one of us, it involves not merely a confession and acknowledgement of our sins, but it also involves a willingness to turn away from the wrong things of life 
and the wrong ways of thinking and being willing to turn to the Lord himself. Did you know it doesn't stop there? There's another verse to consider. Literally, three verses, like I told you. These three verses really shows us how to get clean. Okay? These three verses shows us how to get clean. Number one, we have to confess our sins to the Lord. No doubt. Number two, we must be willing to forsake the wrong ways and the wrong ways of thinking and be willing to turn to God. Number three, 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 14. When we consider 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 14, literally the same exact end result, but tell me what you see in 2 Chronicles 7 14 that you do not necessarily see in 1 John 1 9 and Isaiah 55 7. And notice what it says here. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, God then promises, then will I hear from heaven and I will do what? Forgive their sins. There goes the cleansing again. He's forgiving and removing our sin. He's removing it. He's removing the guilt. He will cleanse us and he'll heal our land. What do we see in this verse that we didn't necessarily see in 1 John 1, 9? And we did not necessarily see in Isaiah 55, 7. What, what do you see in this verse that adds a little bit more to the puzzle? What is it that you see? Humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. That means you've got to be teachable, right? Got to be teachable. And again, that can parallel with the turning away from stubbornness, okay? Listen, stubbornness is dangerous. Now, I'm 47, so if I'm talking to a 5-year-old or a 7-year-old, they'd probably look at me and say, you're old. <laughs> and I would rebuke that statement in the name of Jesus. And so, you know, I would basically say, look, I'm not old. You know, in other words, old becomes like a thing of perspective, quite honestly, to, to a very large degree. But I will say a fact. The older you get, the more hard-headed you typically are. That's an unfortunate thing about reality. It's a lot easier to change the seven-year-old's mind than the 47. And it's a lot harder to change the 67-year-old mind than the 47. You get it? So we have to be what the Bible calls, not what the Bible calls, but we have to be what is called intentional. You gotta be intentional. You gotta be willing to become teachable all over again. It's hard. You know, one of the things I think a lot of us don't consider why the Pharisees didn't listen to Jesus is because he was so young. Seriously, believe it or not, he was so young. It's like, you haven't even been to any of our schools. So not only were they like, look, you're uneducated, but also it's like, you're not even, you haven't even broke 50 yet. You know, you're just three years plus from the age of, a, of an official rabbi. How in the world is it that you're going to be teaching us? So, believe it or not, older people have a real hard time being instructed from a younger person. It is, it's, it's in the Bible, and it's certainly in real life. But, that is indicative of one that is not humble. I remember one time I was talking with a man, and I had to correct him. He was older than me. He had to be in his 50s or 60s. And I corrected him. And uh, he, was a, he, was a, he was a religious leader. And I said to him, I said, well, actually, I said, I don't agree with that. And he said, what? And, you know, I said, no, I, said, I can't agree with that. And he said, well, how, how do you figure? And I said, well, the verse says this. And I began to walk through the scripture. And I remember he, he started to pull out his card. You know. He started to say, young man. You know, that's how he started his redirection. Young man. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, young man, you don't understand. How old are you? And I said, oh, I'm 40, whatever. And he said, uh, you, you know. I, do you know how old I am? I said, I have no idea how old you are. And then he told me his age. And then he told me his degree status. And as he told me his degree status and everything else, and he said, so, young man, so I hope you can understand that this is why I'm instructing you this way. I said, I understand exactly what you're saying, and I was respectful. I don't play with that. I'm very serious. Always be respectful to your elders, even if you disagree with them. And so it is that I respectfully disagreed. I said, I still can't agree with you. And he said, what is your basis of your disagreement? 
I said, I am 40 something years old. You are 60 something years old. But the words that are in this book are older than both of us and our parents combined. And so if my mind is faithfully recording and repeating what these ancient words say, then I'm actually giving you counsel that's older than you are. And you should be willing to submit to it. He didn't receive that very well, but nevertheless, <laughs> I tell you that story just to simply help you understand, family, that when we talk about getting clean, the Bible's not here to make it all difficult and, 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 and something so hard to find and you got to dig through a thousand mountains to figure it out. What God simply wants you and I to understand is this. To get clean requires simply this, based on the summation of these verses. Acknowledging your sins without excuse. Confessing them before God. Choosing to forsake ungodly ways and thoughts. By returning to the Lord and living a life of prayer and pursuing godliness. This is how you get clean. All day long. This is, this is contextual to the idea of the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sins. Because remember, the blood was shed over 2,000 years ago, but that's like a check written. Check's written. But remember, a check is worthless to you personally until you cash it. And God is showing us not merely the story of the check written, meaning Jesus dying on the cross to save man from sin. That's the beautiful story. Wonderful story. Most incredible story in the world. But God says, I want you to cash it. God says, I want you to get the personal benefit. And God said, now this is how you get the personal benefit. Benefit. You see, 1 John 1, 7 does make it clear that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. But the reality is, is that this is the process of how to receive that blood of Christ. Personally, I and you must be willing to acknowledge my sins with no excuse. There's no he made me do it, she made me do it. But we must be willing to confess them before God and choose to forsake ungodly ways and thoughts by returning to the Lord and living a life of prayer pursuing godliness. Do you know that this is the reason why we have young people, especially today, that will confess their sins today and be back in their sins a week later? They don't understand the true process of how God cleanses us. Probably because we as parents or adults, maybe we didn't teach them well enough. I don't know. But the reality is, is that this is how you get clean. And this is by and large a decision. I was counseling with a couple a couple weeks ago. I do more counseling than anything else. I do more counseling than preaching and then teaching combined. My wife and I are both undergoing certifications right now as health, life, and marriage coaches because we're seeing that, man, there's so much problems in the world of health, there's so many problems in the world of marriage, and there's so many problems with people that don't even understand the purpose of life. And so my wife and I was like, look, we're going to go ahead. So we, you know, we, we, we signed up and we're, we're in the process right now of getting certified in health, marriage, and life coaching. And I'm super excited about it. I love being an instrument in God's hands to help solve people's problems. And so it is that, I tell you the truth, we have to learn how to be practical with people. You can't just tell people, just believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. That, again, that's parrot behavior. I don't know if some of you, how many of you were here when I talk about the difference between a parrot and a person? All right? You're, again, a parrot is an animal that knows how to repeat what it heard but it does not have understanding. You get that? A person has the ability to hear and repeat what it heard with understanding. Proverbs 4, verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all that getting, get understanding. It is imperative that you understand what God is saying. Not that you just know how to repeat what he said. And so it is that what we're doing is we're going, we're going beyond just repetition. What we're doing is we're understanding what God is saying. He says, look, my desire is to cleanse as many as are willing to be cleansed. But God says there's no way that we'll be cleansed if we are unwilling to do anything 
that's on that board right there. So I remember I was counseling with a couple. They were in another country and they needed some counseling. And so we were doing some counseling a couple of weeks ago. And I remember that I, as I was counseling them, I said, now, I want you to think about this. I said, let's say a man is living in his house. Let's say a man is married and he commits adultery on his wife. He leaves his wife for another woman. It's a terrible thing. And when he leaves his wife for another woman, he starts to live with that other lady. Moves in. Everything. Packs his bags. Moves in. The gospel comes to that man's heart one day. He's at church. He hears a message that was startling. And as his heart is awakened to the truth, that man makes the decision to say, you know what? I'm leaving that house. I'm going to tell this lady it's over. I'm going to go back to my family. I'm going to try to rebuild what has been broken down. I refuse to entertain any of these things that I used to entertain anymore. I'm going to get my life right with God. Is that a good thing? Yes. No doubt. Now watch this. So then that brother, he gets inside the taxi cab. He's, he's on his way to the house to tell that lady it's over. I'm moving out. Everything. And this is literally what I shared with the couple. Because the husband was very estranged from God. And I was helping him to know how to come back to the Lord. And here it is that while that brother's in the taxi cab, Mack truck runs past the red light. And the Mack truck, pow, slams right into that taxi cab. Kills that man instantly. I said, question. What's the brother's fate? Heaven or hell? And the husband said, um, not sure. The wife said, heaven. I said, correct. In other words, he acknowledged his sins without excuse. He took the full guilt for it. Then he confessed his sin before God. Then he chose to forsake the way he was living as well as the thoughts that were bringing him to the way he was living. He made a decision, I am going to return back to the Lord. I'm going to now live a life of prayer. And from this day forward, I am going to live the life that God has called me to live. But he never got a chance to actually, like, do it, do it. He didn't even get a chance to move out. He got killed. In the eyes of God, as far as he was concerned, God says, it is as if he already did it. He was already determined. The only thing that stopped him was an incident that was beyond his control. And so in the eyes of God, God said, that's it. That brother's clean. The same way like that guy who died on the cross. The same way like many people who sometimes in their dying moments makes a decision to turn away from their sins and to live a life of righteousness. And they never got a chance to actually live the life of righteousness, but they were determined to do it had they had the privilege of living. So this is largely choice-based. But that choice should be followed through in action. If you're understanding what I'm saying thus far, let me hear you say amen. amen. All right, so one thing that we know for sure is how to get clean. Now, for the remainder of our moments together, the next question is, how can I stay clean? In fact, is that even possible? Do you know that there are churches and places where people say things like, I mean, you can't stay clean, but you can just keep trying. There are people and churches and places that actually let people know you can strive against sin, but you can never really have victory over it. I'm telling you right now, have you ever heard anything like that? That's a very perverted gospel. That's not the gospel in its purity. If we study the Bible carefully, there are precious promises in the Word of God. Let me show you just a few. If you look at some of these promises here, here's what the Bible says. In Jude verse 24, it says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from what? Falling. And to present you how? Faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Well, when is God going to do this? 
Is God going to do this after the second coming of Christ when this mortal shall turn into immortality? Is that when God does this? No, 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 no. Notice what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from how much? All filthiness of the flesh and spirit. And then it says perfecting holiness perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Did you know that you can live a perfectly holy life in a sinful world? God really wants to get this point across to you and I. Because I don't know about you, but you ever, you ever, you ever made a mistake or you ever seen somebody, somebody says, this brother just called himself perfect. No, no, God forbid. That, that, that just means you're not listening to me. Don't be a pack. Be a person. Understand what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. Some of you heard that I used to be a dancer and a choreographer in the entertainment world, okay? I used to be a, a dancer, a professional dancer and, and performer. Now, if there's one thing that dancers lots of fornication, okay? And that was me. I grew up in a completely worldly home. I did not know anything about the Bible or any of that. So that was the life that I lived. But the great news is, is that when I found myself the kind of guy that would go to one person or another person or another person, one day when I met my wife, I was so stricken by her beauty and also stricken by her character. And then combining that with my love for God, here it is that it is 22 years later in marriage that I am thankful that there's no other woman that I have been in bed with or anything of that nature. In other words, something happened in my experience with God and my experience with my wife that I was able to experience victory over something that normally had me and held me bondage. And my point is very simple. If God can help a man get victory over one sin, there's no reason he can't help a man get victory over every other sin. Amen. What's the thing that you used to do that you have not gone back to it? Because of your walk with God. If God can give you victory over one sin, then he can give you victory over all sin. Amen. And so it is that you can perfect holiness in the fear of God. In fact, John the Revelator said it like this. A time will come before the second coming of Christ that he will say, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. But then it says, but he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And then it says, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. I looked up that word still. It means henceforth, forever. God literally says before the second coming of Jesus, there will be a people that have already obtained holiness and righteousness. And that is how they will be for the rest of their existence. And so there is no question that you, you and I not only have the privilege of getting clean, you and I have the privilege of staying clean. But the reality is, somebody says, but wait a minute, aren't we born sinners? That's the question, isn't it? I'm so thankful what the answer is, is that no, we're not born sinners. Born sinners comes from an idea of something called original sin. Original sin teaches that the concept of original sin was first alluded to in the second century by Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyons, in his controversy with certain dualist Gnostics. Other church fathers, such as Augustine, also developed the doctrine, seeing it as based on the New Testament teaching of Paul, the apostle, in the Old Testament verses of Psalms 51.5. You know, Psalms 51.5 is a very interesting verse, by the way. It says uh, that humanity shares in Adam's sins transmitted by human generation. Look at that bottom sentence there. According to Augustine and Calvin, humanity inherits not only Adam's depraved nature, but also the actual guilt of his transgression. We are born guilty. This is a belief. And that's the reason why you have certain churches that will baptize babies. <coughs> you understand that? 
that's the idea behind baptizing a baby, because the baby's not just born with a sinful nature, but the baby's born a guilty sinner. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches the furthest thing from that. In fact, go to Romans 9. Let me show you a text a lot of people probably have never seen, read, considered before. Go to Romans, the ninth chapter. Let me show you this. I thought that this was very powerful. Again, we're dealing with the idea of... Are we born sinners? Well, in order to be a sinner, you've got to be guilty, that's for sure. But I want you to see something that uh, Romans, in it's chapter 9, and it's a beautiful means of reasoning. God is reasoning with the people in the church of Rome in that day, Paul, and as God is walking through the Word, I want you to watch what he says, because he's dealing with those who claim to be the followers of God, but really are not. And here's what he goes on to say. Picking up in the story in Romans 9, it says in verse 7, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Not everyone is a child of Abraham just because they're Jewish. This is what Paul is challenging them on. Just because you're Jewish as far as the flesh is concerned, no, you're not necessarily a child of Abraham because even Jesus said, if you're really a child of Abraham, you will believe as he believed. Continuing. He then says in verse 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, watch verse 11, it says, For the children, being not yet born, neither having done any what? Good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to the election, might stand, not of works, but of him that called him. You see, when you're in the womb, you've done neither good nor evil. You understand that? When you're in that mother's womb, you've done neither good nor evil. So there's no way that you can be born guilty because you didn't do any evil. Why would somebody be born guilty if they've never done anything evil? The only time that somebody's born guilty or somebody is guilty, it means that before you were called guilty, you must have done something evil. But the Bible just said, no, when you're in your mother's womb, you've neither done good or evil. Are you following that? And so there's no way that we are born sinners, born guilty. That is not what the Bible teaches. That is what history teaches, but that's his story. Not the Bible story. Do you follow that? Well, let's continue. And so it is that when we think of the word sinner in the Hebrew, it means one who commits sin. Are you following that? A sinner is somebody who commits sin. You're not a sinner just because of the nature you have. You're a sinner because of what you do with that nature. Are you following? Got that? Okay, so watch this. So when we think about it, what is sin? Watch what the Bible says. Whosoever, what's the word? Commits. Do you see how the Bible does that? I like that. This is how you can know what a sinner is, right from the word of God. It says, whosoever commits sin breaks the law. For sin is the breaking or the transgression of the law. You're guilty when you commit the wrongdoing. That is the way the Bible teaches it. Are you following that? So we are not born sinners. We are born with a sinful nature. The sinful nature says, go right, go right, go right. But God can give you and I something that we do not have to, to surrender to the call of the sinful nature. Amen. God can give you something that when the sinful nature says, go right, go right, go right, there's going to be a small voice that's going to say, choose to go left. I have provided you power to go left. And then by our choice, no matter how much the nature says go right, we can choose 
to go left. Now watch. Isaiah 13 and verse 9 is very clear who gets the condemnation. The Bible says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. He shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. The people who get destroyed are not the ones that have sinful nature. It's the ones who have committed sin. Those are the ones who get the destruction. And so there's no question that we can stay clean. There's no question that we can live above sin. But it's going to require a very important experience. The Bible teaches that even from our mother's womb, God can do something very special. The Bible says, but thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Not only that, Psalm 71 says, For thou art my hope, O Lord God. Thou art my trust from my youth. By thee have I been holden up from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. Continuing. Psalms 139, 13, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Jeremiah 1, 5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified or chose you. And I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. You know, there's only two people in the Bible that we know of that were born filled with the Holy Spirit. And that was Jesus and John the Baptist. In Luke 1, 15, it says, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. You see, God can be there in a person's life right from the beginning stages of their life. And the same way that the devil's there, ready to tempt and to taunt and to eventually bring us into sin, is the same way God can be there from the beginning to lift us up encourage us, and help bring us in the path of righteousness. And this is why godly parenting is so important. You see, the only reason we have the story of John the Baptist is because there was an Elizabeth and Zacharias. The only reason, the reason why we have such a great story about the child Jesus was because there was a faithful Joseph and a faithful Mary. Parents, we play a gigantic role of the future of our children. I mean, we play such a huge role because the only reason why God could bless in the way he would bless shortly after that child was born was because of godly parents. But there's no question. God can keep us from the moment we're born. And he can keep us that we don't have to fall into the traps of sin. When we think about this idea, how can I stay clean? I'll give you two verses. John 15. In John the 15th chapter, I'll give you two verses. We're doing great. I'm so thankful for how the Lord has helped us night after night to be very well in managing our time. And so it is that in John the 15th chapter, how can we stay clean? Because the answer is definitely, yes, we can. God can keep us clean. Yes, we have a sinful nature, but there's something else that God can give to us. In John 15, notice what the Bible says right there in verse 4. If you're there, please say, Amen. 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 It says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, Except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. So God makes it clear. You want to stay clean, what must we do? We have to abide in him. Now, to abide is kind of like if I, told, if I said to you, welcome to my dwelling place. What am I talking about? My what? I'm talking about my home. If I said, welcome to my humble abode, what am I talking about? 
I'm still talking about my home. In other words, abiding and dwelling are synonymous. Follow that? Yes? All right. Now watch this. How do I stay clean? The answer is, abide in God. But what does it mean to abide in Him? 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3, how do I abide in God? And remember, what is the word that is synonymous to abiding? Dwelling. Don't forget that. Dwelling. How then do I abide in Christ? God is telling me what to do. He's telling me to abide in Him so I can bear much fruit, etc. But now the question is, what does it mean practically to abide in Him? 1 John 3, verse 24. The Bible says in 1 John 3 and verse 24, it says, And he that does something, what do they do? He that keepeth his commandments, what? Dwelleth in him. What's another word synonymous to dwell? So he that keeps the commandments abides in him. Yes? So what? And he that keeps his commandments abides in him. And he in him. And hereby we know that we abide in, he abides in us by the Spirit which he hath given unto us. Somebody says, what does it mean to abide in Christ? Well, it's very simple. To stay clean requires being filled with and constantly led by God's Holy Spirit in keeping his commandments. That's how you stay clean. That's how you stay clean. That's exactly how you stay clean. By being filled with and constantly led by God's Spirit in keeping His commandments. That's how you stay clean. That's exactly how you stay clean. And there is no other way. And God wants us to understand that this is possible. As fast as you accept Jesus Christ into your heart is as quickly as the Spirit of God is willing and most certainly able to live out the life of Christ in you and me. You see, when we confess our sin, we just learned what sin is. Sin is breaking God's commandments. So obviously, if you're returning unto the Lord, that means you are now willing to keep God's commandments. Well, you can't do that by might or by power. You can only do that by His Spirit. And so you're going to need the Holy Spirit of God so that you can stay clean. Now somebody says, well, how do you get the Holy Spirit? I don't even know how you do that. Let me give you a couple of closing verses and then we'll wrap it up. Luke 11. How do you get the Holy Spirit? How do you, how do, you do that? Well, Luke 11. The Bible says in Luke, the 11th chapter, I want to show you, how do you get the Holy Spirit? The Spirit of God is how you and I can actually abide in Christ. That's how we are able to dwell in Him and He in us. It's by His Spirit. And His Spirit enables us to do the things that are right all the time. Well, how do we get His Spirit? Luke, the 11th chapter. And it was right there in Luke, the 11th chapter, that I want you to show this, and I really, really relate to this. My father was the kind of man, my father was the kind of man that would go at deep lengths to surprise me and my siblings. I remember my dad told me he was going to get me a car, my first car. And I remember I was in high school still, and dad said, Wayne, we're going to get you a car, and you know, he explained what the car was, and I was just so excited. I said, Dad, you really going to do this? Yep, we're going to do that. And I remember that I went to school because that was the day I was supposed to get my car. And I went to school, and I mean, I was so happy that day in school. I mean, there was nothing a teacher could say to get me mad. There was nothing anybody could do to get do anything wrong because, I mean, I knew once school is over, I'm going to come home, and I'm going to see my car in the front of the house. Well, I'm sitting in class. This is a true story. I'm sitting in class. And I'm just listening to the teacher. Yep. Mm -hmm. Felt like studying that day. <laughs> and I just was, yep, yep. And next thing you know, you hear the, you hear the radio. Dwayne Lemon, come to the principal's office. 
And I'm just like, I didn't even do anything today. You know, or whatever. I was a bad guy. But I mean, I didn't do anything bad that day. I knew I didn't do anything that day. So I was like, I am not in trouble. I didn't do anything wrong today. So I'm walking to the principal's office trying to figure out, okay, what did I do? Did I cover my, did I cover my tracks? You know, I'm going through all this stuff in my head. I get to there, there's like, uh, Dwayne Lemon, uh, your, your father's on the phone. He needs to talk to you. He said it's an emergency. I get on the phone. I'm like, Dad? He's like, Dwayne, son, we tried. We tried so hard. We tried to pick up the car and, you know, such and such. And I mean, he's just going in and I'm just like, huh? <laughs> and he's just like, yeah, you know, we, we, can't, we, can't, we can't pick up the car. We can't do it. Dad, you serious? Yes, sir, I'm sorry. And I was just like, okay. You know, poof, get over the phone. Man, I'm dragging my feet back to class. I'm sitting down in class. Do I even do that? I don't feel like doing it. You know, it's just like my day is just ruined. And so I'm finally walking home. And I took my regular walk home. And as I'm walking home, there was this block. Like this block, it's like two blocks away. I could see my house from that block. And I remember that as I was walking up the road, I was looking at my house and I was like, what is that? It was this red thing. And I was like, what is that? And I'm walking up closer and closer and that red blurry image started to look like windows and a body and tires. And I was like, my car! I am running faster than the speed of light. <laughs> and as I run to my house to see my car, my father's sitting right there like this. <laughs> my father found so much joy in giving us gifts. And whenever I read what we're about to read in Luke 11, I always reflect back on my dad. Because let's notice what Luke 11 says. It says in Luke 11, verse 9, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be open. You would think that this is just some open counsel with Jesus just saying, ask people what you want. Jesus had something very specific on his mind. What was on his mind when he was giving this counsel? Verse 11. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? And then here we go, verse 13. How do you get the Holy Spirit? Very simple. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, God says, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? I think everybody can do that in this room. Tonight you can ask, Lord, I naturally, I don't want your ways. I naturally, I don't want to do what you want me to do. I naturally, I don't want to forgive. I naturally, I want to take vengeance. I naturally want to just get some fun. I naturally want some personal stimulus. I naturally want a whole lot of stuff. But God says, I understand that. That's why Jesus says you must be born again. You need a new power inside of you. Yeah, you got the sinful nature, but what now you need is that spirit that brings the divine nature. And the spirit of God will give you power. That every time your old nature says, let's go right, the spirit of God will say, choose to go left. And he will give you power, not only to get clean, but much more important, to stay clean. It's not by might, family. It's not by mere human power. It's only by God's Spirit that you can get clean and you can stay clean. Heaven will forever have a record. There will be no excuse for sin. 
God's Spirit is available to you as much as He is available to me. And there's no such thing as you made me so mad, I had to sin. There's no such thing as I was tempted so strong, I had to sin. There's no such thing as any of that. That works good with men. But that will not succeed with God. God says, what sin was so powerful that my spirit was too weak to give you victory over it? And so my friends, tonight we have answered the question. How do you get clean? How do you stay clean? With God, this is possible. And so if it's your desire, this is not just a message to the alcoholic. It's not just to a message to the drug addict. You know, often they use these terms in alcoholism and drug addiction. They, they use terms like, I've been clean for these amount of months or whatever it may be. No, family, we have to understand we're dirty people too. We're sinaholics. But God wants to clean us up. And it doesn't matter. I mean, the most beautiful thing in the world to me is that it is 100% true. You might have come through these doors dirty, filthy, an absolute bona fide mess, but you can actually leave by a choice, by a decision. You can actually leave here clean. That's just a beautiful thing to me. You can leave here clean. And so if you're hearing me under the sound of my voice and you're saying, you know what? I'm dirty. I'm wretched. But you know what? I'm thankful that God is willing not only to clean me up but to keep me clean. And I accept heaven's offer tonight. And I choose to be clean. And I choose God that he might keep me clean. If that's you, please stand to your feet with me. Now I'm going to invite my ushers uh, to please grab these cards. There's a card that's going to be given to you because this is a very pivotal point in our study because beginning tomorrow and throughout the remainder of our time together, we're, we're going to go down a very powerful road of Bible study, but it's, it's going to transition a little bit. And so tonight, I need you to take hold of these cards. And I'm going to ask the ushers to give each individual in this room one of these cards. And some of you filled these cards out before, but I'm going to go ahead and ask of you to please fill it out again based on the appeal. In order to get clean and to stay clean, part of the process is something called baptism. It's something where it's a public demonstration of what God has done in your heart. If you've already been baptized, then this doesn't apply to you. But there are some of you in this room that may have not been baptized. Maybe you got baptized when you were small and meant nothing to you, and therefore you might see a need for re-baptism. And so I'm giving you these cards here because part of the process of getting clean and staying clean is that if you've never been baptized, I want you to especially pay attention to that part of the card that says, I want to be a part of God's remnant, commandment, keeping church. I'm so sorry. The third uh, button, I am looking forward to baptism. Or the fourth, which says, I desire rebaptism. If that is you, that you're saying, you know what? I want to follow through on this process of not only getting clean, but staying clean. Baptism is a public declaration that you have been cleansed. And you want to go ahead and let the world know about it. And so if there's anybody here, and we don't rush people into the pool, I want to let you know that. When you make this decision, this is to let us know how to work with you going forward. But we don't rush people into the baptismal pool because getting baptized is like getting married. And I would never rush someone into marriage. And so it is that in like manner, we don't want to rush you into the pool. We want to help you to make sure you know the decision that you're making, and then from that, prepare you for that wonderful, glorious event. And so if that's any of you in this room, that's what you want to put a check next to. I'm looking forward to baptism, or I desire rebaptism. Otherwise, there's some of you that may say, I don't have a church family right now, but I want to be a part of God's remnant, commandment, keeping church. If you want to be part of that, you don't have a church family right now, but you would like to make this church a place that you can call home for yourselves. Well, you got a lot of people here that sure love having more brothers and more sisters. And so we would love to have you and to embrace you as part of God's family. 
if you're making a decision for the first time in your life, I dedicate my life to Christ, then you go ahead and you fill out that check. If you got a prayer request, we have a prayer group, then you can hit that bottom one and say, please pray for me. I have a special problem. Finally, if any of you desire a visit, if you'd like for myself, my wife, uh, to come by and visit you, or the pastor and his wife, maybe one of the elders, to come by, to visit with you, talk with you, pray with you, maybe a little counseling. If you feel that need, you put that, just put there, visit. Just put visit right there on the side of your paper, right under that little image of the Bible. Just put visit right there. And then that way, we will go ahead and we will contact you and we will visit with you. My brothers and sisters, you've made a wonderful decision tonight. I want you to please believe it. As long as you're sincere, you literally are clean. I want you to think, when we're finished praying, you're literally going to be clean before God, regardless of your past. And then you only have one thing to do. What's that one thing we need to do? Stay clean. And there's a helper that will be with us every step of the way. Let's pray together. Our loving Father, we thank you so much for the blessing to be able to hear your voice. We thank you for speaking to us, Lord. We thank you for truly allowing us to see how we can not only get clean, but through the power of your Spirit, we can stay clean. Lord, help us to believe these words only. Sometimes our feelings will say, oh, you're still dirty. No, God can't forgive you. Help us to learn how to rebuke the voice of Satan and to only live by your word that says, if we confess our sins, if we forsake our way and our unrighteous thoughts, if we humble ourselves in your sight, and seek your face and pray, turn from our wicked ways, you will hear us, and you will forgive us, and you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then, Lord, give us your Holy Spirit, that we might not merely thank you for being clean, but through the power of your Spirit, help us to stay clean. This is our prayer and our thanksgiving that we give. In Jesus' name, amen. Please make sure that you put the appropriate check or fill out the appropriate area on your card. When you exit the sanctuary, you will see that there will be someone ready to collect the card from you. Tomorrow morning, we want to extend an invite to you. Tomorrow morning is what we call, is what the Bible calls the seventh day Sabbath. It's a day of worship. And so tomorrow we're going to be here. We want to invite you to come worship with us. At 11 o'clock... We're going to be doing a very important message. The question is, who could be against us? Now that we've made all these wonderful decisions, who could possibly be against us? Well, we're going to answer that question tomorrow in the most mighty way. And so we're hoping to see you tomorrow at 11 o'clock. And if we don't get to see you tomorrow at 11 o'clock, please remember that tomorrow evening we will come back together at 7 o'clock. All right, we look forward to seeing you. We will now have our songsters come before us to give us our closing song and allow the ushers, please, to help you exit the sanctuary.